Good to see everyone out this morning. I tell you, it's a beautiful day outside. We have a good Lord, folks. He's three times holy. Amen. Brother Mike Berry, would you lead us in prayer, please? believes the Lord's holy? Amen. How many believes he's twice holy? Three times holy. Amen. If you would stand, get your All-American Church hymnal, turn to page number 115. Holy, holy, holy. Sing as unto the Lord, folks. 115. there, Joshua. You're standing on the holy ground. Good to have you this morning. If you're visiting first time, I'd like you to raise your hand and we'll give you a card and let you fill it out. And we'll be passing the play here in a moment. Put in anybody here in the back. We've got some folks. All right. We're glad to have you. Anybody else first time today? All right. Well, God bless you. Amen. Good to have you. Home folk, visitors, foreign, aliens, whatever. We're glad to have you. Amen. Folks on the back row back there, where are you from? Where? Knoxville. All right. Amen. God bless you. You're home, folks. Good to have you. All right. I'll meet again this evening, 6 o'clock, for the evening service. And uh, I'd like to invite you to come be here this evening service because 
I've got a message. I think it might be grateful, very, very helpful to you. And then Wednesday night at 7 o'clock is going to be prayer meeting. If we're here. Amen. 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 Hey, brother. I'll be here tonight. It's going to be good. Bet you. Amen. If you would stand and get your All-American. Now, wait a minute. Choir. Just call up the choir. <laughs> choir, come on up. <laughs> Page 167, the All-American Church hymnal. Oh, I want to see him. Got carried away. Folks, that sounds like a rapture to me. Amen. Uh, that's what we're hoping anyway. If you would stand and get your All-American Church hymnal, turn to page 141. Yes, I know. Let's do the first second, the last verse. 141. <clears throat>
seated as the choir can play. shedding of blood, there's no remission. Let's have the ushers come up here this morning, take up the offering. Brother Mike Caldwell, lead us in prayer, please. This morning we've got to Michelle Keaton. She's going to be singing for us.
There's peace in trusting the Lord. Peace when my faith and fear are at war. So I don't have to worry. He knows what's in store. And there's peace in trusting. good. That's very good. If you have your Bible, turn to the book of Ezekiel, chapter number 38 this morning. Ezekiel 38. 38th chapter of Ezekiel. chapter number 38 and verse 1. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him. And say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. And I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws. And I will bring thee forth and all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Verse 5 is very important. Ezekiel 38, 5. Persia, Ethiopia, Libya, with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gober and all of his bands, the house of Togamah, of the north quarters and all his bands and many people with thee. Father, bless this book now. In thy name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. <clears throat> what you just read there was written 500 and some say 70 years long in that period of time before Christ. So you're reading something that was written 2,500 years ago. 
And it mentions a entity that must be in existence for this prophecy to be fulfilled. There's no doubt whatsoever that the prophecy was not fulfilled in the lifetime of Ezekiel. It says plainly that these are for the latter days, verse 8, many days thou shalt be visited. In the latter years thou shalt come to the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of men and people against the mountains of Israel. Now, Schofield, C.I. Schofield, you know, many of you have his reference Bible. It's a good reference Bible. I don't agree with everything the brother says, but it's a good Bible. And he makes reference to Gog. And he was laughed to scorn when he said this, and it was in the first part of the 1900s. And here's what he said. He said, the primary references to the northern European powers headed up by Russia all agree. So therefore, he says plainly that this prophecy is definitely speaking about Russia. Now, let me say this. The prophecy of Gog, the land of Magog, is one of the most controversial things in the Bible, is locating exactly who we're talking about. Before we go back to the same thing that I mentioned a moment ago, 2,570 years ago. And who in the world would know 2,570 years later? Tell anybody in the house, tell me what will be here 200 years from now. Nobody. You know, that's ludicrous question to even ask. This is Bible prophecy, but here's a key. Look at verse number 5. Ezekiel chapter number 38 and verse number 5. This is a key. This is something that you can nail down because there's no mistaking it whatsoever. Persia. See that word Persia? Persia places an entity that is in existence right now, and it's called Iran. So therefore, Gog is connected with Iran, or modern, or, or at that time Persia, but today modern day Iran. So what do we do then? Well, we, it seems to me that, uh, that Brother Schofield is pretty close to the mark when he says that this prophecy relates to a northern power, and north of Israel, of course, is this great you know, folks, did you know that Russia has eight time zones in it? you realize that? America has three. Do you realize a time zone spreads about 1,000 miles? If you got in a jet plane that could travel 1,000 miles an hour and take off at the equator, you could, put the, you could take off when the sun was setting right in front of you, and you'd fly for three hours, and the sun would never set because you're moving at the speed of the sun across the earth. Russia has eight of them. It's a huge country. No other country on this earth has the land mass that Russia has. It's the bear. It is a dominant force, a dominant power, has been for a long time. So the book of Ezekiel talks about this coming down and attacking Israel. Now he says in verse number four of Ezekiel chapter number 38, he said, and I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws. I am against thee, O Gog, O Gog. Now, you know something, folks? The Bible is quite a book. And I'm not a master of the Bible. And as a matter of fact, I've never met a man who is. But the Bible is a book that will keep you intrigued your whole life if you'll read it, pray over it, study it. Don't ever judge the Bible, folks. Please don't do this. Please, please. Do not judge the Bible by a lifetime of shallow nothing that you've heard about the Bible. Amen. This book is much deeper than that. I have preached 45 years, and I'll tell you I haven't even scratched the surface. Fact is, God's showing me things now that I hadn't known for years and years and years until this point. He excites me because of what's in this book. So don't get bored with the Bible. The Word of God is quick and powerful. It's alive. And uh, so the Bible is quite a remarkable thing. So when we read the book of Ezekiel, chapter number 38, it's talking about something, something that's going to happen in the latter days. It makes it plain. The latter days is, you can equate that with the, with the, with the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is a prophecy in the Old Testament, full of the Old Testament prophecy over and over and over again. The day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord. And in the New Testament, 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, we have what's called the day of Christ. They're not the same. So the day of the Lord is a specific period of time, and I firmly believe from what I've studied in the Bible that it's what's called the time of Jacob's trouble, not the time of the church's trouble, not the time of our trouble, 
but it is the time of Jacob's trouble. Make no mistake about it, folks. God takes the temperature of the world by what's happening in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Now, how many of you have ever heard of Samuel Clemens, better known as Mark Twain? Mark Twain, he's quite a witty man. He said, I came in with Haley's Comet, which comes by every 75 years, and he said, I'll leave with it, and he did. So Mark Twain lived 75 years on this earth. He made a trip to the Holy Land in 1867. He traveled over there, and as he's, he's rich in vocabulary, he's quite a remarkable person in that sense because he was quite a writer. Have you ever heard of Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn, the rest of them? We read those when we were kids in school. Here's what he said about the Holy Land in 1867. He said the Sea of Galilee was a solemn, sailless, tentless lake. In plain words, he said there was no beauty about it, nothing to desire about it. He said that he, he explicitly states that the area was desolate and devoid of habitants. Riding on horseback through the Jezreel Valley, Twain observed, there is not a solitary village throughout its whole extent, not for 30 miles in either direction. He said one may ride 10 miles hereabouts and not see 10 human beings of all the lands. There are for dismal scenery, I think Palestine must be the prince. What about that? Say, so why is that important? Well, in 1867, there wasn't much about uh, northern powers coming down against the land of Israel. Amen. And there's no hotels and motels and the rest of it over there and no tours being taken to the Holy Land. Plain words, it was a non-entity as far as the world was concerned. It was a desert over there and it had a few people over there and here it's set. Yet the Bible must be fulfilled. And so C.I. Schofield in the first part of the 1900s and others said that Israel must become a nation again in order for the scripture to be fulfilled. Do you know what? They laughed him to scorn, but you know what? It did. Amen. May the 14th, 1948, David Ben-Gurion stood up and declared Israel to be a sovereign free nation once again. And my friend, it was at that time the clock started ticking. And at that moment, people began to focus their attention upon Israel. And the Bible says, Jerusalem shall be trodden down the Gentiles. It shall be a stumbling block. It shall be a burdensome block. It shall be a burden to all the world is Jerusalem. So when we read the Bible, we realize that there are those who believe the Bible, and because they believe the Bible, God shows them things. So we have Ezekiel, we have Gog and Magog, we have prophecy, we have an association with Iran. That can't be disputed. Iran is the, of course, it is the ancient Persia. We have Russian history to deal with this morning. How you know you've heard of the Bolsheviks time and time again. Did you know that in 1922, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republic came into being, that it has been a hundred years almost since it started, and Vladimir Putin wants to resurrect it from the dead. That's important, because these things are coming together right now. How many of you are aware that women and children in a European country are dying at this moment. I'm not talking about some third world backwoods place. I'm talking about cities that look just like Knoxville or Chicago or Philadelphia or anywhere, any European city. They have big buildings. They have universities that train doctors and they are being bombarded by the bear, by Russia. It's called Putin's war. You say, well, they'll be over one of these days. Let me tell you something. He has already threatened to use nukes. And that threat is not, a, is, not, is not a vain thing. They say that when Putin says he's going to do something, he does it. It's like Mein Kampf and Adolf Hitler, my plan, my struggle. He said what he was going to do, and he did it. He went with three, over, three, over three million troops into Russia in Operation Barbarossa, and Stalingrad was his coup de grace. He died there. His troops did, and it was over because Russia has been the jewel of that area. Now, on all of that area, they want the world. And, and when the Bolsheviks overthrew Russia and took the Tsar down and murdered his family, and they started the communist rule in Russia, they put these people under subjection, and they ruled over them with a rod of iron. And to this very day, how many of you have seen the Russians in the streets demonstrating against what's going on? 
They don't, they don't like the idea of killing uh, innocent people. A 17-year-old girl. They took her and they raped her. Then they murdered her. That's the kind of monsters you're dealing with. Vladimir Putin is a war criminal. That's why God made hell, folks. He's a war criminal. He's a murdering devil over there in uh, Moscow. He's a killer, an indiscriminate killer, a cold-blooded killer. Amen. And he started this war. Why did he start it, preacher? He wants land. He wants to restore the Soviet Union. And what is he doing? He's using the Ukraine as an object lesson for the rest of the world. He's saying, watch what I'm doing here. And if you dare interfere, you will see destruction like you've never known before. What's it called? It's called nuclear blackmail. So what happens? Well, what happens? You're going to note what happens. You're going to pay attention to what happens in the next few weeks, yay, months, or whatever, how long it takes. What are they going to do about Vladimir Putin? If they give up Ukraine, then there's Poland and there's Hungary. And there's the Baltic states. If they give it up, then he goes to the next one and to the next one and to the next one. When Hitler went into Czechoslovakia, the Sudetenland, they let him have it. But then when he went into Poland, they said enough. And World War II started. And my friend, it started because they realized there's going to be no end to it. There'll never be any peace. There will never be peace with Vladimir Putin. There will never be peace with Russia. And you are not safe simply because you've got two oceans to protect you. Amen. You're not safe. The Cuban Missile Crisis back in the 60s, Khrushchev put these missiles down there 90 miles from American soil. And we had a president at that time who was a man of courage because he'd served in World War II. And he wrote a book about that. I forget the name of his book, but it's real good. Profiles and what was that? He was shot down or something like that. But anyway, his name was John Fitzgerald Kennedy. And he said to Khrushchev, you either take those things out of there or we'll drive them out of there and we'll drive you from this, this land and this, and, this, and this part of the world. He stood up to him face to face. Watch what happens from the White House. Watch what it, watch it, see what happens. Now listen to me this morning. There's what's given for public consumption. That's what you get. But if you want to know about what's really happening, you have to, you have to go by the crust, the public consumption. And you've got to dig a little deeper to see what's going on. And so, my friend, don't ever believe what's coming out of Washington, D.C. or Moscow. Don't believe it. Get on your knees before God and say, Lord, is this thing going to stop? Or is this, is this hell that's coming down on the world, is this just the beginning? Because if it is just the beginning, that's where I'm going to head now in this message. Because if it is just the beginning, there's a reason for it, right? There's a reason for it. All things work together according to the will of God. He worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. You need to understand today that not so much as a sparrow falls to the ground without Almighty God knowing. So there is a reason for this, and he may very well use it. One man has the power to plunge this world into a living hell. One man. It shouldn't be that way, should it? It should never be where one man can destroy hundreds of thousands of lives. There should be a, there should be a fail-safe system set up where one man cannot make that kind of a decision. But they've got a clock, and it's called the Armageddon clock, and that clock is ticking, 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 ticking. Russia is the aggressor. No question about it. He's the aggressor. Now, about 30 years ago, a man by the name of uh, Zeranovsky, his name was Vladimir Zeranovsky, he wrote a little, uh, he, he, he did quite a bit of writing for that matter, but he said something about the dash to the south. And in that, he, uh, he, quite, he kind of revealed the, uh, the, the, the mindset of uh, what goes on in the Kremlin. Listen carefully. He'll say this, and the Kremlin will deny it, for public consumption, but the truth of the matter is what he said is what they really believe. Listen, this man got 25% of the vote in Russia, has over 100 million people. That means that 25 million Russians 
voted for Vladimir Zirinovsky. His own words, the final thrust south. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time with what he said, but it's important to understand what he thought. In his 1993 autobiography, The Final Thrust South, he reveals a chauvinistic, imperialistic perspective on domestic Russian politics and world affairs, neither liberal nor democratic, tempting to dismiss Zirinovsky's outrageous book as political polemic, but a failed Austrian painter and former army corporal was similarly ignored. And when he published his own track, Mein Kampf, and they like to dismiss this, here's what he said. These are his words. He said this. He said, as, as it refers to Russia, some of his most outrageous statements reported in the press include, let us make others suffer. Only fear makes people work. Democracy presupposes violence. Dark, skinned street vendors in Moscow make it look like a non-Russian city. There is a black stain that should be eradicated. Jewish children are going to school while our children are hungry and forlorn. If you vote for me, it'll stop, he said. The United States is being overrun by blacks and Hispanics. Had you ever heard that before? No. You haven't heard it. You know why you don't hear it? Because the news media feeds you what they want you to know. And if they give you something, they've already got to figure out how they're going to use it. Are you listening? This is a man that got 25% of the vote in Russia, and he said blacks and Hispanics are overrunning America, said back in the 90s. Listen carefully. You and us, the Russians, share the same threat from the dark-skinned people from the third world. Now listen carefully. I would bomb the Japanese. I would sail our large navy around their small island. And if they so much as cheaped, I would nuke them. That was said in the 90s. Are you getting a hold of the mindset of what's going on in Russia? Amen. Are you getting a hold of that? Because you need to understand that to understand what's happening in the Ukraine. These people aren't playing games. The Russians are brutal. They're brutal killers. And they'll kill anybody that gets in their way. And they're destroying cities. How many of you have seen the refugees as they leave? Have you noticed all of the mamas and their babies? Have you noticed that? The reason you notice so many mamas and their babies is because the men are staying back and fighting. From the age of 18 to 60, they cannot leave the country. They've got to fight. But if you listen to the mamas, if you listen to the mamas, if you listen to the mamas, you will have a firsthand experience about what courage is about. Amen. Courage, real courage. Courage, real courage. Think about it. Their courage encourages me. Amen. 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 Not this religious blather that we hear in America all the time. It is the truth lived out before your very eyes. Courage. These people are fighting, some of them, with, 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 with a hand weapon, with a, with, a, with a sickle or something like that. They don't have a gun. They're staying home fighting for their homeland. Did you know in the 30s that, uh, uh, that uh, Stalin uh, starved over, over 3 million Ukrainians to death and they haven't forgotten it? And they like to tell you that the Ukrainians and the Russians and all of them are the same? They're not. They're not. There is a distinct difference between a Ukrainian and a Russian. A distinct difference. It's a, it's a, it's a sovereign country in its own right, a first world country in its own right, a prosperous country in its own right, and it is being destroyed at the hands of a madman. So Schofield tells us, war in Europe a few weeks ago was unthinkable. War in Europe, folks. Europe has had its wars, but nobody thought that this would happen. Even the Ukrainians didn't expect this to come down upon them. And this is why they weren't fleeing. Yet it's a reality that we have to deal with now. I don't know about you, folks. I don't know about you. You have to make your own decisions. But if this thing 
devolves into a nuclear war, and it possibly could. The world's never seen that before. Amen. It'll make World War II, which was a horrible, horrible thing, but it'll make it look like a picnic compared to the people that'll suffer and they'll die right. from a nuclear holocaust. So that puts fear in the hearts of people, doesn't it? Are you listening? It puts fear in their heart. The Antichrist has to rise. He's got to come about. Putin is not the Antichrist, I do not believe. But the Antichrist is going to use events. He's supposed to be a peacemaker. These are the last, these are four things that I want you to look at as we come down to the close of this age. The power of the Antichrist and the false prophet. The Bible said they can call fire down from heaven. They can perform miracles in the sight of the people. Therefore, they become a very, very associated with the religion, the religion of the day. You see, the religion of 2022 is entirely different from the religion of 1922. Amen. It's the religion of the day. So they call fire down from heaven. Then the bottomless pit opens up. The word bottomless pit there in the book of Revelation chapter number 9, the word bottomless pit is from the Greek word abyssos, the abyss. That's what it's talking about, the abyss. And when the abyss opens, up comes creatures that defy Definition. There, it's, uh, it, read it. Read what it says about these creatures that come upon this earth out of the abyss. It's horrible, 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 horrible. Then the third thing that you can look for is demonic forces that lead armies. One of them is, refer, is referred to as a 200 million man army into the battle of Armageddon. This is in the book of Revelation. They're led by demons unclean spirits. We say it's bad. Yes, it is because the world is ready for the demonic. Amen. They're ready for it. Right now, they're ready for it. Say, so why? Because they've rejected Christ. He's the life. He's the truth. And without him, there's nothing but death. And then finally, the elements. The elements declare war on this planet. Stars of heaven fall. The seas turn to blood. The earth is like a dead man. And the rocks, and they cry for the rocks and the mountains to fall upon them. The boils all over the body of those that take the mark of the beast. They plead for death, and death flees from them. This is what's coming for the earth. You want to be around for that? I don't. All of this is in preparation for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. It says in the book of Daniel that when he shows up, he will be a man of peace, the Antichrist, a little horn. Now that cast in a completely different light when you consider this, that we are on the verge of a world war, not just a war with Israel. Most of the preaching and teaching about that has been the, with Israel being attacked by Iran or somebody else and that the Antichrist steps in and they sign a covenant. Well, they're going to be attacked. Make no mistake about that. But right now, we're only two or three years away from a nuclear weapon in Iran. You get different figures. Depends on who you're reading. Israel will not let them have a nuclear weapon. That's a fact. That's a fact. They'll not ask anybody anything. All of a sudden, they'll do what they did when they struck Osiric. They'll come in there and they will destroy their nuclear capabilities because they know that once Iran gets it, it's a religious yihad, holy war to come and wipe them from the face of the earth. And so it goes. So what happens? We have a man of peace, the Antichrist, loved and accepted by everything on earth. Revelation 13, they take his mark. They take his name. And when they do this, they become his. He owns them from that moment on. And he makes peace. So what peace does he make? He makes peace in a world that is at war. Folks, this world is headed for war. Yes, All it takes is one button the wrong way or one confrontation of, uh, of, of, of two army, even, a, even just a, a company or a, a battalion, a regiment or something like that. And the world is plunged into war. And it will beg for peace. 
It will beg for peace. And the only one who will be able to bring it peace is the Antichrist. That makes him a peacemaker. Now here, thank God for this. John said, I was caught up in the spirit of the Lord's day. He was caught up into the third heaven and saw things that were that you couldn't even write about like Paul did. It's unbelievable, the joy and the glory. My goodness gracious folks, if we knew what was waiting on us, I mean, if you really knew it and, and experienced it in your soul and could see it, you'd want to walk out of here right now. You'd leave this place behind. You wouldn't even bother to say goodbye. Perhaps when the body's present with the Lord. Amen. We know where we're going. We've got a home in heaven. I know where I'm going. I've got a home in heaven. And he is not going to send his church through the tribulation. We're going to be gone. I show you a mystery. Well, the, but the day of the Lord is not a mystery, folks. The Old Testament's full of the day of the Lord. He said, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed Amen. in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. And what is that mystery? It's the mystery of the catching up of the body of Christ Amen. to meet him. So what does that mean? That means that every one of us in here this morning, if we had the faith, true faith in Christ, if we're really his, really his, you may look at the TV and see the mushroom cloud, but I'm going to tell you something. You're going to leave out of here in a moment and the twinkling of an eye and be gone. Are you ready? Has it got your attention? As what's going on over there in Europe, it's Eastern Europe. Europe is divided in two like you wouldn't believe, Western Europe and Eastern Europe. We're looking at Eastern Europe. And what's happening right now, folks, I wouldn't stake anything on it. It could blow up at any moment. It could. Are you ready to go? Amen. I'm ready to go. What do I do to be ready to go, preacher? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. That's what he said in Acts chapter 16, verse 31. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. You I mean, that's all I'm supposed to do, just put saving faith in him, believe in him, trust him, accept him, rejo re you know, receive him. How do I do that, preacher? From your heart, you cry out to him and you say, Lord Jesus, I want a savior. I want you to save me. Whatever words that come out of your mouth, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but salvation is the most personal thing you can do. He that hath the Son hath life, Amen. and he that hath not the Son hath not life. Once that happens, you're born again of the Spirit of God. And if we don't make it home tonight, that's okay. Amen. If I walk out that door right here in just a minute and I hear a shout, glory to God, are you going? Amen. We're going. It's that close. I believe with all of my heart. Father, bless your word. Lord, we've seen wars before. We've seen, we've seen bloodshed. But my father, I've never seen anything like this. Never. Not in my lifetime. This is an entirely different thing. It may be just the prelude to something that's going to come down. And it may be a while yet. I don't know. Who knows? I can't set a date. But Lord, I don't believe the world will ever go back to be the same as it was before. Just like when that plague came upon us. That changed the world forever. Now this is going to change the world forever. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, come. In thy holy name I pray. Let's stand and sing. Brother, what have we got? Page 394 in the All-American Church hymnal, I Surrender All. I Surrender All.
if you if you like to do a little reading, a little research, go a little further, I only quoted, made, gave you a few quotes. This is from theheritage.org, okay? The man, the author of this is Ariel Cohen. And the title is Zaranovsky in his own words, excerpts from the final thrust south. And he's got the full document, the full, the full page there. If you'd like to read that, it's available. All you got to do is to log on, go to heritage.org, and, the, and, and, the, and it's ready, and you can read it. Now, get ready. I don't know how you can handle things. I mean, I, you know, I don't know how easily you are offended and uh, so forth because these people don't talk like they do in America. They don't talk like they do here. You know, what you hear here is fabricated, commissioned, spoon-fed, and it passes certain rules and regulations. When people like this talk, that's raw. It's just the way they are. You say, well, that's Zaranovsky. No, 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 no. That's Vladimir Putin. That's the name of the one who said it. But what he said, Putin believes full, completely. He said the worst thing that has ever happened to Russia is the demise of the, of the USSR. It was a geopolitical disaster that's unbelievable. That's what he said. And he's going to put it back together again. As you've seen the first move. Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. The time we've had together. Bless these folk. Your word will go forth. Not return void. And Father, all, if, 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 if all this preaching this morning simply gets people to study a little bit, read a little bit, look around, ask some questions, then I've accomplished. I've accomplished what I intended to do. In your holy name I pray. We've got a couple little children going to quote some scripture here this morning. You still have them? Y'all go ahead and be seated. Just take a minute for them. beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was nothing that was made. In Him was life, and the life was, was light of men. And the light shines in, shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Amen. beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, without whom was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Good. <laughs> Outstanding. All right, let's stand up, folks, and we'll, uh, we'll go. Forget the service this evening at six o'clock. Father, thank you for the time together. Now bless these folk, keep them safe, and bring them back safe again this evening. In your holy name, Amen.